Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Soulcation Podcast. I'm here with Minda Hart. She's the founder of The Memo, which is a career development company for women of color. She's an adjunct professor at NYU. She's a speaker who's conducted workshops uh, and keynotes at corporations like Bloomberg, Google, Time, um, Incorporated. She's also the author of the bestseller, The Memo, and also a podcast host, professional women of color called Secure the seat okay because this is uh the year of securing the bag so <laughs> she's gonna teach you how to secure the seat as well welcome to the soulcation podcast minda thank you logan so happy to be here of course uh we shared the stage in mississippi together so i had the honor of meeting uh this amazing woman so this interview is about to be everything so you all just <laughs> <laughs> make sure you have some pen and paper out so take us back to minda in college like were you always this outgoing, like, let's go back to the college you? <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's funny because you know how it, metamorphosis, okay, girl, a metamorphosis. Um, I've always been like outgoing, but it, in an introverted type of way. So with your close friends, you know, like people wouldn't know that you have much of a personality if it was uh, outside of like your close circle. And so in college, I um, was pretty low key uh, and kind of, you know, had friends, but definitely wasn't as vocal. I had not, I, I had my voice, but I hadn't found it in a way that I found it later in life. And so I was very shy. And so I think that allowed me to be cautious for a lot of things. And so uh, it's so funny when like friends of mine from college and grade school come to like book tour and they're like, who the heck is this, this <laughs> Minta? Because they don't know me in that way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but then once you start to get comfortable in your own skin, I think, um, you shake off a lot of uh, what you what you think others might think of you or, or you're afraid. And so I, I let my curiosity be larger than my fears, I like to say, because me living small or playing small was not helping anybody. And so once I allowed, gave myself permission to show up in my fullness, um, and that took time, I, I definitely... I'm thankful that God um, ignited that inside of me because I'm I would have been missing out on me. Mm, y'all let your curiosity be stronger than your fears mm. <laughs> so let's go to after college you start working in corporate america how did you get from there to comfortable enough to leave your job because you ended up leaving your job right i did uh after many several years uh but that was one of the things i think corporate america it forced me to use my voice because when you go into an environment where you're one of the only one of the few black women uh you'll realize that people will continue to treat you any kind of way if you don't step up and st um, stand up for yourself or advocate for yourself not just in like a a black woman kind of way but also just your finances your negotiation just you know being a woman in the workplace and so i realized that nobody was going to save me but me <laughs> And once I realized that I had to find my voice and leverage these relationships and build relationships, and that would require me understanding what I wanted from corporate America and making work work for me. And um, one of the things that I had mentioned, I was very shy. So I took a public, I invested in myself and paid money to go take a public speaking course, a few of them, and a, and a what do you call it, an improv class, all these different things, because I felt like I had to push myself out of my comfort zone. And that was the only way I was going to secure any kind of seats or bags. And so, and it's funny uh, because now being a public speaker, getting paid, I would have never guessed 10 years ago, you could have never told me, Logan, that you would make money off of speaking because I was like petrified to the point where before meetings, I would go in the bathroom and like throw up because I just the sheer thought of speaking in public made wow. me that nervous. And so, um, but the, the interesting thing about it was I knew that there was more for me and I fought to meet who I saw myself with who I was. And so once they married each other and found each other, it was like a combustion. I, I knew she was in there, but I had to find her and investing in myself was that way. And once I found my voice and said, you know what, I actually have good things to say to contribute to the conversation. Um, and when I advocate for me, because no one's going to advocate for you the way that you can, uh, then I realized that I held more power than I knew. I love that. That's so good. Can you break down investing in yourself to the audience? Because a lot of people think, okay, I went to college, though. I got my master's. I have my PhD. I'm, I should be good. So what does that mean moving forward? 
Yeah, uh, and that's what I thought too, right? You have the degree, you get into the job and you think, okay, that's, that's enough. Uh, this is what they told me I should have done. That's what the Cosby showed us, right? You get your college degree, you get the brownstone. Uh, <laughs> but, but what you don't find out is that there are certain tools that we need in our, in our toolkits, right? And so for me, one of those tools was public speaking. If getting your bag, getting your seat, getting anything that you want, would if I'm afraid to ask on it, then what is the tool I need to help me conquer that fear, right? And so that was, I went and paid for out of my own money, those classes, because I thought that that was something that I could use um, in the workplace. And then um, maybe you're, you've invested in your, in your wardrobe, right? Uh, you've invested in going off with your friends to vacations or retreats and all those things we need in our toolkit. And so thinking about a wide range career-wise, personally, financially, you know, relationally, what are those tools that we need? And it will take an investment on our part uh, to do something different than we never done before. That's true. Because I feel like anything you do, it has to be sustained or it has to be leveled up. Like, yes. no matter what, relationships, friendships, everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're the author of the memo. It's a bestseller. Um, and there's a lot of women that listen to the podcast like, I want to write a book. You know, what gave you the courage? Let's talk about the courage to write the book first. Well, you know, you're a, you're a published author as well. So you know that there is, um, there, it's a scary place to put yourself out there in that vulnerable state. And again, as I mentioned, being someone who naturally is an introvert, and that's, that's still the case, <laughs> that, that uh, putting myself out there in a way, because I think as Black women, we've been conditioned to be the strong Black woman. You know, don't talk about, your feelings, don't tell anybody your business, you know, that's the way we move <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and so for me, you know, being the only one in corporate for 15 years, I was always reading these business books, but I never read about what it's like to be a black woman in the workplace. Uh, women, yes, but not about black women, okay, women of color. And so Toni Morrison says, write the book you want to read. And because I wasn't an author or I didn't see myself in that way I was like oh I couldn't possibly write a book right I I wasn't even that good you know in my English classes and so how how could I do this but again that that letting your curiosity be larger than your fear if there is something that you want to do then you owe it to yourself to to be curious go down that path because you're never gonna know um, fear will get you every time if you let it and so for me, I said, okay, well, I've been working in the space of um, advancing women of color in the workplace since 2015. And I thought, okay, this book hasn't been written. So, uh, and God kept showing me these signs of doing it and doing it. And I had this one gentleman um, in 2016 say, Minda, you should write a book. And I said, oh no. And for six months, Logan, I said, I'd meet different people along the, the way and they'd say, you should consider writing a book. I think there's a story to be told. And I kept saying, no, no, no. For six months, I said no. And then eventually I said, okay, God, clearly you want me to write a book, right? And, um, and longer story short, went back to the, the man that told me the first time I should write it because he said, if you ever want to do it, I'll introduce you to an editor and this, this, and this. And I almost missed my blessings, okay? <laughs> because I let fear. I said, no, that's not, that's not for me, but I didn't know it. And so going back, um, within a year's time, I signed a book deal. I had a book deal. I had an agent because I went down that path. And, and for me, I would have never guessed again, you put your, your soul, you put your art out there. You don't know who will read it, who will resonate with, but if five people read it and it changes their lives, you are a success. You're a bestseller. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, what you're supposed to do. Exactly what you're supposed to do. So put it out there. There. The first, when my agent went and shopped the book around, four of the major publishers out of five said there's no audience for a book like the memo. And the devil is a lie. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so if you have that thing that you, you have, get it out there because there's an audience. They will find you. Trust me. That's so good. What about the women who are like, okay, I'm going to do it. I have the courage now. I listen to this episode. I'm ready. <laughs> and they got notes in Workflowy, Evernote. They got them on a tablet. They got notes, just stuff everywhere. How did you structure your book? What was your plan? 
Yeah, I'm old school. Um, so it really was uh, writing down the notes. But one of the things that I did, because I was still working. So one thing I must say is that when I was writing my book, I was still in corporate America. And I was also still um, building my company, The Memo. And so I had a lot of things on my plate in life, right, at the time. And so what I did was I, those vacation days that many of us have, I said, you know what, I need, I need a, a location. I got to get somewhere. <laughs> And, and so one of those things was because I just needed the space to be able to do it. Um, because sometimes we have to put pause, like we can't be the caretaker for, for everyone and not ourselves. And so uh, one thing that I said before the end of the decade, but this was actually a couple of years ago, I wanted to take a solo trip to a place that I'd never been before. And so I hit two birds with one stone. I went to Japan by myself. I booked a ticket for 10 days and I said, I'm going to go to Japan. Um, travel around and I'm also going to write my book proposal which included two to three chapters um so my agent could shop it around and that's what I did I did two things that scared me right went to Japan <laughs> and wrote the book but um when I came back handed it in and three months later we closed on a deal and so giving yourself that space uh to write to create it's hard to be your best if you don't carve out that time for you to rejuvenate that's so good and it's so true because you really there's nothing you can give to other people empty right and i mean empty like not like knowing who you are empty like <laughs> you don't have any energy empty None. yeah no. yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> all right <laughs> let's roll through the hot topics of the book honey yes network building what does that mean how can someone build a network yeah, I know we hear like the, these hot topic words, right, of networking and things, but really the thing that helped me in corporate America and has helped me as an entrepreneur is building a squad, like making sure you have people in your circle that you're meeting. Like for me, the new social capital really is social media because you can no longer say, I can't meet so-and-so or I can't connect with my tribe because there's people just like you, like minds out there if you put yourself out there. And so um, building a squad, and for me, I live by the mantra that success is not a solo sport. And so it would, we need each other, right, Logan? We need each other to amplify each other's work. And so living on an island or, or living in scarcity will never get you to your next level. And so for me, that would require putting yourself out there to meet new people. And so in corporate America, I made sure that I built relationships with people in HR. I built people. Uh, relationships with people in IT, right? Because if your computer goes whack and, and you don't got time to put in the the ticket and wait, you know, three hours, but you have that resource, right? Or who's speaking your name when you're not in the room, right? Um, so maybe on paper, you're not, um, you don't have five to seven years experience, or you don't have 10 to 15 years, but you know, you could do that work. And the person that's advocating for you knows it too. So they put your name out there. And now you got the job, right? Because you built relationships they can vouch for you because many of you know that hard work doesn't get us the advancement anymore rarely right it's not because you work the hardest that you get the the extra check it's because of who you know and so if you don't even if you're an introvert you don't have to be like nene leaks and be the life of the party but you got to make some friends <laughs> okay. you got to make some people um that you can connect with because i'm telling you once you open it, and we're going into this new decade, right? We're in a new decade. And so it's important that we have people that live, maybe not you're in a small town, right? That doesn't matter. Don't let um, however many uh, people live in your community on that sign when they roll into the town, stop you from what you have to do. You can build relationships. You get to build, back in the day, there was MySpace, right? A top eight. You get to build your top eight, um, but you got to get out there and, and go to the, the meetups, you know, tweet, whatever it is. But you hold the power in your own hands. That's so true. And I think what um, a lot of people um, miss out on is like genuine connections because mm -hmm. they're trying to get from people. Right. How do you build a genuine connection with somebody that you're honestly wanting to invest in also um, without trying to use them, basically? Oh, yeah. 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 Speak on it. Speak on it. This is something I write about in the memo uh, because... I think in our generation, I mean, obviously it's happened a lot, but I think you see it um, more prevalent is this using mentality, right? So you only hear from somebody when you need something and a, re a relationship is reciprocity, right? Yeah. And so building a relationship 
is not just who can speak your name when you're not in the room, but who can you speak about when they're not in the room? Okay. <laughs> so um, one of the questions that I love that you ask is who else do you know, you know, as women who could be on, on the podcast? And I think it's so important that we elevate and amplify each other because we all get to win. We all get to shine. There's enough to go around, but don't be like that leech, right? And so let's say you do meet somebody and you're building out your squad. Ask them what, how you can be helpful to them as well, right? Because um, Lauren Hill, she talked about um, reciprocity, right? Like reciprocity is real. <laughs> you, yeah. you need that. And so um, I know for me, even if there's people who have helped me that I have not seen in years, but because we stay engaged, right? Yeah. You know, we, um, it doesn't matter if you've actually seen them face to face because they know that you're genuine. And I think that's the key, like going into this next phase of our seasons is, is the genuineness, right? Because everybody's busy, everybody's doing things, but it's who can you vouch for that you know that, okay, I don't have to worry about them because I'm going to throw them the ball. They're going to, you know, dunk it. And I don't have to worry about no mess after it. And I think that, that, that's the important piece, right? People have been stung so many times by people. And so don't be that person that stings them again, because then that closes folks off from building good relationships. That's so true. What I really love about generation, um, the, about the baby boomers is they're going to look out for you, you know, <laughs> don't you dare act like they never helped you. <laughs> like that's the, that's the only slap in their face that they'll ever, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to like publicize it, put it on Facebook and they don't care about that, but don't act like <laughs> I didn't help you, you know exactly. what I'm saying? Exactly, yeah. and don't mess up my name, my good name, right? And and we all still feel that way, right? Because there's things that will come across, you know, my quote unquote desk and I'll be like, who can I give this to? But I got to give it to someone who I know will do right with it, right? <laughs> so know that part of that integrity, who you are, your personal brand, all of that's important and, and how people engage with you as well. And that's not how many followers you have. That's who you are as a character issue. Yeah, I agree. So what kind of office politics did you run into and how, how did you, how were you able to like handle it professionally? Yeah. I think it's tough. Like I think half of the, the, one of the main reasons why I wrote the book is because we don't get to read about our stories, right? You know, there are office politics, but then there's this other layer of game being played when, with us, right? And we're seeing it right now unfold on a larger scale with like Gabrielle Union, right? And, and some of the stuff that she's going through. And, you know, even though she has the blue check mark and she has the money and, you know, the credentials, she's still a black woman at the end of the day and her coworkers still see her that way, right? And so there's certain games that she probably played. And then when she said, I don't want to play and that's part of office politics. And I think as black women, um, we have to decide what game we want to play if we want to play it and knowing, but a lot of us don't even know there's this game being played, right? We have our head down at work. We're working really hard and we're waiting for someone to come tap us on the back and be like, it's your turn. You know, like <laughs> it's time for a raise. And, and, um, and all these other things are happening at happy hour and at the, at, at lunch and different things. And I think that um, we have to be in those rooms. Um, we can no longer just say we're working hard and expect certain things, that there's a different game to be played. And I think once we understand the rules to it, then we can secure those seats and we can secure those bags. But we have to acknowledge that um, historically that table was not created for us to, to be at it. And so it's, but it's going to require us to then dismantle and rebuild the tables we want to sit at, but that's going to require us to lift our head up, right? Not just keep it down and, and those sorts of things. So um, let our voices be audible and, and articulate our wants, because the only way we're going to get those bags and get those seats is if we ask for them. Um, if you're in a, in a traditional sense, right? Uh, but let people know that you want them. Uh, we've silenced ourselves long enough, but part of the game is knowing who to ask, <laughs> right? Because building that network at work will allow you to go to Bob or Brenda and say, here's what I need, right? <laughs> but we can't do that if we don't have relationships with Bob and Brenda. And so part of those office politics is, I hate to say that likability factor, right? And, and sometimes we don't know that this is going on. And so I wanted to pull the curtain back on some of the some of the things that are going on in the workplace so that we are better suited um, to build our tables or sit at new ones. 
I love it. I love when you um, talked about the raise. So when negotiating your raise, you know, you've earned it, you're working hard, you're sitting at the table, but, you know, the opportunity has just presented itself. How do you start that conversation? Like what information should you have before walking into that office to have that conversation? I guess that's two <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing about work in any setting, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're working um, in a company or organization is having some of those difficult conversations. And I think that's the part that uh, we aren't sometimes good at just in general, because we don't want to rock the boat, so to speak, right? And so if you know that as a, a Black woman, you want the six-figure salary and you're not making that, and then you get that phone call and someone's like, we could give you that, right? But you spent, in my case, I had at that time spent 10 or seven years at one firm and had this call unexpectedly in this new offer. And I could have said, well, I'm not going to go for it. I'm just going to wait it out here and see what happens. <laughs> but I did um, like my job, but I had to have that big girl conversation with my manager. And so I talked to mentors um, and sponsors that I had, because sometimes we can make decisions in a, in a bubble. And I think it's good to get other other voices. So then ultimately you make the decision that's best for you. And so for me, I gathered all my information, which was the research, the ranges. I even had been keeping a log of the things that I had done at my current job to show that, Hey, I've been adding to the bottom line. So when I go into this important meeting for negotiations, negotiation is a high stakes game, right? And so um, you can't just go in willy, willy nilly, as my grandmother would say. And so longer story short, you have to read the book, but I went in with all my facts and all my cases and I'd been working there and I had a good reputation. And I, I said, you know, I've had an offer. I wasn't looking, but uh, I would love to stay at this company if you are able to give me X and um, longer story short, they weren't able to give me X, not when I needed it. Uh, they were like some now, some later, all of this. And I'm like, you know what, as black women, we have to learn to center ourselves because for so long we've been putting everybody else ahead of us. And that would require me to leave Los Angeles and move to the East Coast, but it would position me five years. I could have everything I said I wanted in a month. If I would have waited at my current job, it might've taken years to get to the next step. And so I took, I bet it on me. I bet it on black, right? <laughs> and I took the job um, and I went on uh, to, to make the money and get the title that I deserve. And sometimes we think we don't have options uh, mm -hmm. because we sit in these spaces and we say, oh, this is the best it's ever going to get for me. I'm here to tell you that there's more. Wow. That's good. We got options, ladies. We have options. <laughs> hey, and that's personally and professionally, um, you have options. Don't ever think that if you're not getting your due in whatever situation you're in, know that you have options. It is hard to leave. I will never say that it was not hard to leave, but it was better on the other side. Wow. Oh, that's good. That, <laughs> that can go for anything, honey. Anything, everything, okay? <laughs> like, there's this one, I was uh, recently doing a book talk and one woman had sent me a message. She's like, it hit so many ways. She's like, but what really hit me is that I was not in the relationship that I was supposed to be. <laughs> I was like, whatever you get out of this conversation, it's amen, amen. I'm, here, I'm, here. <laughs> I'm here for it okay so we're gonna do some rapid soul questions something uh the first thing that comes to your mind okay we'll just right. ask you random questions name one person you think is really funny i think tiffany haddish is funny, <laughs> funny. <laughs> i actually just re-watched uh the movie with her and um what's the movie with omari hardwick oh yeah uh I, 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 and, and Tika Sumter or so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I can't think of the name of the movie. Yeah. That one. It was, yeah. it was, I laughed, <laughs> I laughed like I hadn't seen it before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last song you listened to? Uh, you know, I actually just listened to, um, it's, I think the guy's name is William Murphy, but it's working. Like it, it's my season. Like that's the jam right there. Like I listen to a lot of stuff, a lot of ratchet, a lot of things, but like, that's, that's my, like, that's my soul song. <laughs> yes. That's so good. Ugh. Yes, William Murphy. Um, <laughs> what dessert can't you live without? Oh, God. Uh, you know, creme brulee. I just love really? that hard top. <laughs> <laughs> She's so fancy, you guys. I can get it from the bodega. It doesn't matter where it's from. I just oh, love that crunchy top. <laughs> And you That's it. like crack when you. Yeah, I just 
love it. I'm like, oh, yeah. this is good. <laughs> <laughs> what trait do you like about yourself the most? I would say generous. Generous. I think that I've always been a very generous person with time, with money, uh, because generosity, it really is a privilege when you're able to be generous. Mm, that's good. If you could go to dinner with anyone, who would it be? Passed away or still alive? Uh, you know, actually, if I could go to dinner with anybody, well, I, all day, every day, it's always Beyonce, right? It, every answer is always Beyonce, but <laughs> if, I, if not Beyonce, then I would really love to um, go to dinner with Lucille Ball. Like, um, I love Lucy. The fact that she was able to create um, a production company and all these different shows at a time where women weren't able to, weren't looked upon as people who could create in that way. And then her art is still showing up today like if you watch a, an episode of I Love Lucy you would still laugh like it you know even in 20 uh you know whatever um and I just think that her legacy has just left such an imprint on art and so I, I would love to to talk with her more about what it's like to to see your art still present itself in in modern day and affect people in a positive way that's good that's the first person uh, nobody's ever said her so that, that's, <laughs> that's dope I'm going to have to read some more on her. That's making me... Really yeah, happy. yeah. Like, she was so much more than just the, the I Love Lucy character. She created all of these... She was part of a production company uh, that created a lot of those, like, Nick at Night shows that... Or those Nick shows that you've seen. And, and, and was one of the first to really do it as a woman. So, really inspiring. That's dope. Okay. Uh, what's one book you believe everyone should read? Outside of the memo, um, your book. <laughs> um you know, uh, there's this, it's a poem book, actually, that I really love. It's called uh, Heart Talk by Chloe Wade. I don't know if you've heard of her, uh, but it's, um, yeah, if you love poetry, it's just really beautifully written. Heart Talk, okay. Putting that on the list. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you looking to do next? How can the Soulcation community support you, look out for you? Like, what's going on? What's next? Uh, well, you know, purchase the book. That's important because as black women when we support each other especially as writers then others get to tell their stories too because it shows that our stories matter and so um support anytime you run into a black woman author buy her book uh because <laughs> it's important um but for me it's just i'm going back into the classroom uh this spring i sabbatical for during book tour and so um and also working on two more books so be on the be on the lookout Nice. Congratulations. Thank I you. Am here for it. Thank you so much, Minda, for coming on. Thank you for having me. I, it, it's uh, ever since we met in Mississippi, I, and I'm like, I got to get you on mine too. So I'm glad. Um, <laughs> I'm glad we were having this. Thank you. Definitely. Um, make sure you all subscribe to the Soulcation podcast. Share this episode with your best friend. Minda was hitting us with some nuggets for for life. I was going to say for days, but for life, honey. <laughs> Um, so make sure you share this episode and go ahead and support her and purchase the memo. It's on Amazon. It's on her website. And we're going to, of course, share the links. Thank you all once again for uh, tuning in to the Soulcation Podcast. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.